there we go. Okay, so we are recording. Uh, I would just like to, uh, first of all, just say that all the opinions expressed here during this meeting are not the views of the California Coastal Commission or the State Water Board, but of our members, and that um, I hope to have a productive meeting. Uh, thank you everybody today for uh, joining us today in this meeting. We got a really, really exciting schedule. Um, a lot of really, really good presentations. Uh, and this uh, meeting in particular has more of a, a, a Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles Regional Water Board um, general area uh, focus. And so that's really exciting. Um, it's really exciting to have uh, presentations and agendas that kind of like meld together. So I think today is gonna be a really good meeting. Um, so uh, we're on a Zoom meeting, so we don't have to take attendance because I can just generate a report. But if you are calling in on a phone number, I don't know who you are. And I think I have, I think just one phone number. Um, and so if you're calling from a 858 number, could you just please uh, speak up and just introduce yourself real fast for us so that we can uh, take prom uh, proper attendance? And this didn't work last time either. The first people on the phone did not want to identify themselves um so that's okay but um yeah if you are in a oh go ahead if, if you're uh, okay so once again if you're on a if you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone um just please introduce yourself i have i think i only have one number it starts with 858 ends with 323 um if you if you have a moment please just identify yourself right now But if you don't, if you can't do it, that's okay. We can just move on. Um, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces uh, in the guest room today. Um, if there's anybody that's uh, brand new to uh, these meetings, um, I want to give you just a quick chance to say hi and identify yourself. Um, I, I I think I see. I don't know if there's anybody actually out there for, for the. For, I don't know if there's any brand new people today. It actually looks like a lot of familiar names, which is great. Uh, this is Ashley Parks from Squarp. I think this is my first uh, attendance to this meeting. So thank you awesome. for inviting me. Awesome. Yeah, no, thank you, Ashley. We're really looking forward to hearing from you today. And we're really, really glad to have you here. Hey, Michael. My name is Georgia Tugnoli. I'm with the Bay Foundation. Um, I was here in the December meeting, but I don't think I said hi. So thank you for hosting this. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emily Duncan with the LA Water Board, and this is my first meeting, so thanks for having me. Thank you, Emily. We're really grateful to have you here uh, as a presenter today. Okay, and then I also want to just give uh, just a quick moment um, to introduce my co-hosts, uh, Chris Marquis, and Vanessa Metz at the California Postal Commission. If you guys just want to say hi real quick. Hello, everyone. Hello, this is Vanessa. So, so Chris and Vanessa are going to be here today uh, to help me run this meeting. Uh, the, uh, the way our Zoom administrator has set up the, our uh, Zoom calls has made it so that our uh, comments uh, window is closed so we can't we don't have a chat function so if you guys want to speak up just feel free to raise your hand or um, go ahead and email us at these uh, little email address uh, or these little email links which are also down here um, if you have like a long drawn out question you can't for whatever reason speak up during the meeting uh, we'll be happy to read your questions or uh, read your comments uh, during the meeting uh, when appropriate um, so with that I think I think we're ready to go yeah. Oh, and I just also want to say that um, notes and presentations are going to be available after the meeting. Uh, we have required, since this is a public meeting, we have requirements of making everything that we uh, send out to be uh, accessible. And so it just takes us a little bit extra time to make sure that our notes and our, our presentations are accessible after the meeting. But we will uh, work diligently to get that out as soon as possible, send it out to our email list, and then also post, post it to our Coastal Commission Marina website. And with that, I think we're ready to start digging in. Um, I'd like to just take the very first part of the meeting again to thank everybody for being here. I'm really excited for the speakers that we have today. Um, and uh, I'd just like to open up the floor to anybody that has any 
uh, updates or announcements. I'll start with a real small one. Um, Linda Candelaria from the uh, Santa Ana Regional Water Quality Control Board uh, messaged us. She's been going to these meetings for over a decade and she's uh, just want to say that she couldn't make it today, but she really, really um, wanted to say hi and make sure that everybody knew that she tried her hardest to get in. <laughs> Nobody has any fun or exciting announcements from their organizations? Anything they want to share with the group? Well, that's okay. I won't make you. Um, that makes it really easy because um, we can uh, move on to our presentations, which is what everybody's here for. And uh, if something strikes you later, we will have a short period at the end of the meeting where uh, you'll be able to make other announcements if something comes to you later. So uh, last call for announcements. Okay, then let's move forward. So I'm going to, I'm going to hand it off uh, to Morrell and Brenda um, to give their presentation on the Marina Del Rey in water dry docking systems update. And Morrell and Brenda, you should be able to share your screen um, just by pressing Great. it. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I think Brenda's pulling it up right now. Perfect. Yes. Great. All right. So good morning. My name is Morale Tashjan and I work in the planning and environment section at the Los Angeles County Department of Beaches and Harbors. With me is Brenda Ponton, who's from Woodard and Curran, our consultant with the county. So why are we here today? At a past MIACC meeting, my department presented about a non-biocide paint study we had just completed. And we mentioned a promising new in-water dry docking device that we were piloting to address the copper TMDL and Marina Del Rey. So the meeting organizers for MIACC recently asked if we could give a follow-up presentation on that topic. So here we are. Um, next slide, please. For today's presentation, I'll be giving a brief recap of the different copper reduction strategies that we're employing in Marina Del Rey. And then I'll hand it off to Brenda, who will provide an overview of what in-water dry docking systems are, how they work, findings from our pilot, and next steps. Next slide. So this slide summarizes the three main strategies that LA County has been working on to reduce copper loading from anti-fouling pulp paints in Marina Del Rey. One of the strategies is to convert our own county boats to non-biocide paints study their effectiveness and share that information with boaters in hopes that it will inspire them to repaint their own boats with non-biocide or non-copper paints. The county completed a pilot paint study in 2019 that evaluated different non-biocide paints and we are starting a follow-up study in the coming months to investigate four additional non-biocide paints and cleaning strategies that will be monitored over a few year period. We're also encouraging boaters in Marina Del Rey who choose to paint their boats with copper paint to choose the lowest possible leach rate paint. And with the help of our regional board, we recently obtained a list of leach rates for copper paints registered in the state. And we're currently finalizing some outreach material on that topic and we'll be distributing it to boaters soon. The second strategy we've been working on is exploring and piloting different barrier devices to help reduce contact between boat hulls and marina water, reducing the need for hull paint and cleaning altogether. These devices include boat lifts and in-water dry docks, the latter of which Brenda will be speaking more about for the remainder of this presentation. And lastly, in an effort to reduce copper loading released during hull cleaning, the county passed an ordinance in 2018 requiring in-water hull cleaners to get certified in hull cleaning BMPs 
And we're continuing to refine the enforcement of that ordinance to make it as effective as possible. And with that, I'll hand it off to Brenda. Thank you, Ralph. So in water dry docking systems, we originally came across these uh, devices when we were looking into boat lifts as an alternative for uh, anti-fouling paints. And what we found is that these devices, unlike boat lifts, keep the boat at the water line, which provides some safety benefits as opposed to boat lifts that lifts the boat out of the water. And we had heard from stakeholders some concerns with you know, whether there could be tipping and other, other safety issues with that. So these in-water dry docking systems, you can see in the images on the screen, um, they, have the, they have an inflatable or rigid frame that surrounds uh, the boat where it would go into the slip. And the back of the frame or the, or the inflatable portion would lower to allow the boat to go in and out of the slip. There's a pump that then pumps the water out from between the liner and the boat hull so that the boat can sit dry at the slip. And then that provides those um, anti-fouling benefits that uh, don't relate to having to need uh, copper paint on the, on the hull. And um, you can see here uh, that in addition to, to providing that, keeping the, the boat dry and keeping it at the water line, it also surrounds the boat and provides some additional benefits which we'll talk about on the next slide. One more thing to note I, I did wanna mention was the pump uh, does ha usually have an automatic feature to turn on and remove water when it rains so that you, you don't have these things filling up with water when uh, you, you get a big storm coming by. So the benefits. So there are several benefits to these devices. And the big one for us, obviously, is that it prevents fouling and improves water quality. So these boats are, are sitting dry at the slip. They are not needing anti-fouling paint. So we are not contributing to um, the copper issue in, in the harbor by both the passive leaching when the boat set the slip and needing hole cleaning, which also contributes uh, copper to the, the water column. Additionally, because the boat is surrounded by this liner, um, if there is a, an oil leak or gasoline leaking, the, the device captures that and you can see it. And so that's another benefit that the companies have talked to us about. Um, with the boat hull staying clean, We've, uh, there's a noted uh, fuel efficiency benefit as well as increasing speed. And um, with the whole not having to touch the, the water, the, this reduces electrolysis as well. And another interesting benefit is with having these inflatable um, tubing around the boat hole, um, it helps guide the boats into the slips, which is really great for new drivers or if you have an awkward or tight a slip to drive your boat into. And overall, it's protecting the hull from impacts like from the docks or, um, or, other, or other impacts to the hull. And so generally providing this uh, long-term, you know, maintenance, lo lowering the maintenance for, for your boat hull. You're not needing to paint the boats. Um, you're not needing to clean the hull as much. And so it's overall providing some life cycle cost savings there. So the different types that we've come across. Um, since we've been looking into these devices, we've uh, noted two different companies, both are out of Australia and have been uh, working on these and, and distributing these devices in those areas for you know, 10, 20 years or so. Um, the one on the left is FabDoc. These, um, these devices are inflatable around the, the edges. They um, are typically designed to a certain type of boat. So you would provide the measurements of the boat and then select a fab dock based on that. Um, so, so there is some, some requirement in what kind of boat goes into each type of fab dock, but sometimes you can put a different boat in the same device. Um, they typically have a, a lower cost than the other brand that we were looking at. Um, so they're a little bit more affordable in the 8,000 to 24,000 uh, per, per device range. And something to note with these is that the pump powers off the boat battery. So instead of needing to connect to a power source on the dock, you connect the pump to the boat battery and then it, it 
can just use that and not have to have those additional um, wirings. The one on the right is um, a model called CPEN, again, also from Australia. Um, this model is a little bit more versatile and you can put, you can buy, buy, purchase one device and put different types or different sizes of boats in that same device. So it provides a little bit more opportunity on, on how you would use it in the future if you were to change your boat or if you wanted to sell the devices to another, um, another person. These uh, devices though, do have a higher cost. They're typically marketed to new boat owners that maybe don't want to have to paint their hole at all and keep the, the value of their boat high. Um, and um, because of that, you know, it, they haven't picked up much here, um, but they do have, so they do have a slightly different market than, than the fab dock. And then these also, uh, these go off the dock power instead. So they're not using the boat power, they're using the dock power. And you can see in the figure um, that there's this mesh rope lining for the C pen that adds um, a different, another layer between the boat hull and the liner to keep the hole dry, but also functions the same way with pumping the water out so that um, both devices keep the hole dry and, and provide those anti-fouling benefits. <laughs> so when we came across these, um, these alternatives to paint, we wanted to look into whether or not they, how they would work in the Marina del Rey and whether you know, voters would actually like them you know, how long does it really take for them to, to function? Is it annoying or is it beneficial? Um, so, so we did an initial trial back in 2018 and that trial lasted about a, a year. And that was with FabDoc. They let us um, use one of their devices for this period of time. And we put a boat, um, the Sea Scouts boat in this device and had them use it and report back on what their thoughts were about this device. And generally it was, it, they, we got a lot of good feedback. Um, the Sea Scouts had some younger boaters which, who really liked the fact that this helped them guide the boat into the parking spot. So, so that was just an extra little bit, but generally the, the device works um, and, and, and they loved it. So at the end of the trial though, we, we did return it to FabDoc and um, when they pulled it out of the water, we documented what it looked like so we could see uh, whether there was, you know, what the growth was on the bottom of this device. And yes, it does have a lot of marine growth and that's typical. These don't use anti-fouling paint on the bottom. So there will be growth, but um, it was, they were able to spray wash it off and, and it all came off pretty easily. And when we were talking to the manufacturer, they've said that They've had devices in the water before where they've pulled them out, um, cleaned them off, and then sold them as used devices for someone else to use. And so they, they don't cause any damage to the material. Following the trial, we decided that this seemed like it could be a potential alternative for boaters in Marina Del Rey. So we purchased two in-water dry docks for Anchorage 47, which is the county-owned acreage. And that was in June and October of 2019. And so these devices have been in the water since that point. Um, we held a, a demonstration event to showcase these devices to stakeholders, including you know, the boat yards were there, the news, a couple of newspapers came, old cleaners, the sheriff's department, and some, some people from other mar marinas and harbors as well. And so during that demonstration event, we had we had the device in the water. The boat uh, went in, and they showed how it how it worked. And we had the manufacturer from Australia there, as you can see in the, the photo. And in general, there were some um, some a lot of comments about you know how can these devices work uh, and and get all that marine growth on them and and not sink because there's a lot of um, it, there's a lot of uh, you know perception about about what would happen in these, in these um, sinking with um, getting growth on them from back when slip liners or something and they all sunk to the bottom of the marina is the way that the stakeholders were talking about it. So that is the top concern about these for, for those stakeholders. But um, the manufacturer was there to you know, tell them, you know, that is normal. We want marine growth and um, you know, it's you're supposed to have that in the marina. 
that um, in Australia, that is, you know, the way that it goes and, and it's, it's not an issue. It's not something to be concerned about. So um, there was also the, the question about the amount of time that it takes to inflate and deflate. It does take a few minutes for the back to go down and up to allow the boat in and out. And so that was another, another concern brought up. And then, um, then the pumping out of the water after that can happen when you're not at the boat and that takes about 45 minutes. So these are images of the two fab docks uh, actually taken, I believe it was yesterday by Morale. Um, you can see here, they are still floating. <laughs> so that is good. They're doing really well. Um, the owner of the one on the, the owner of the boat on the one on the left uh, loves it. He uh, is interested in using a second one and um, has had no complaints. You can see the image um, under it, which shows the growth on the bottom of the fab dock um, under the water. You can see the 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 um, like the curve of the boat under there, and um, yeah, there is growth. There's a little you know ecosystem out there, but uh, everything's working well. The one on the right, you can see, is empty. We um, unfortunately, the boat owner that was using that fab dock damaged the boat and could no longer use that the fab dock. So we have had it empty. So we're we're getting in a kind of a, a comparison of what would happen if you had a fab dock empty, and it's still looking good. It's still working. Um, it it also has you know marine life under living underneath it. Um, interesting enough, it's it's primarily around the rim and not as much under the base, probably because of some, um, some air bubbles and that type of thing. So they're still doing good. Um, and we still continue to monitor them. And we're looking to try to fill the one on the right, um, on, which is ongoing. So key findings and considerations, you know, in general, you know, marine, marine organisms can grow on the device, it's fine. Um, they, they can get cleaned off or you can leave them there. Um, they, we've had no issues with anything being punctured by, by growth or the device is getting weighted down or not functioning the same from it. Um, there is that reduction in hole maintenance from using the device. You know, you don't need to be repainting. You don't need to be stripping and changing your paints. You don't need to be doing the whole cleaning. And so over a life, life, the life cycle of these devices and your boat, you can get those cost savings from that. And um, also it's, it's better to purchase these, um, to have the individual boat owners purchase these in our opinions. Um, as you can tell with the one that's been empty, um, you know, we, we bought it so that the one boat could use it, but when we didn't have that boat there to use it anymore, we've been having trouble finding the right boat for that uh, fab dock which um, when we do have ones that potentially could fit, sometimes they just don't want to be parked in that location because um, we do, we are trying to keep it in Anchorage 47 at this time so that we can have them next to each other for comparison. And now, even though we're continuing to monitor these, we are looking for additional opportunities to explore this alternative. Um, both the companies that we've been talking to are interested in expanding their services in California. Um, right now, they are primarily out of Australia and expanding in other areas, but Southern California, they haven't picked up as much. Um, and a big reason for this is because they don't have the you know, local maintenance and service uh, professionals to help support such, a, such an effort. Because if you're going to be having you know, multiple fab docks or multiple sea pens, in a marina, you want a local maintenance person that can help support that and be there if they need, if there's questions or problems. And so they're being smart about expanding their businesses and um, have mentioned that you know if there is a demand that they would be interested in looking into you know creating that local service and, and hiring people and training them so that these uh, these can be successful and not just purchased and left and become an eyesore, which is, you know, nobody wants that. So um, we are trying to see how these could, you know, pick up a little bit better if they would work as an alternative in, in our marinas. And with that, we'll just close with um, 
putting up the link to our website. Um, up there, we have more information, including um, we've created lots of uh, outreach documents and flyers for, for the community. We um, are providing updates about the programs and our efforts on the website. And then also we have our in water dry docking pilot um, report that summarizes everything from the, the original uh, initial purchase through the demonstration event and then and some of the cost um, analysis that we did. So if you wanna check that out, um, it's up there on our website on the Toxics Team DL page. And with that, we'll see if you have any questions. Hey, Brenda, this is Mike here. Um, I'm just curious a little bit about, um, do you know if there's any impediments to developing uh, these systems at scale? Do, do the manufacturers, manufacturers in Australia have the ability to do orders larger than just like one dry docking system or two? Like, would they be able to cover a larger uh, uh, arena or acreage? <laughs> Yeah, you know they they do have a they do have a large much larger business in Australia. So again, there was the demand and, and they needed to you know develop the resources more locally. Then they would be interested in doing that. Yeah, uh, yeah, they they do they do um, produce more of these than just one or two here or there. I'm not sure how many they have in in certain marinas though. Um, that was my next question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. Like maybe. I know um, we were talking with Fab Doc, and they were talking about how in one in one marina and in, in near them they have like twelve Fab Docs in one area, and so it just looks like a you know a, a, it's it's really a, a nice touch there, and everyone's picking up on that. But um, we could ask how many they've developed in general, like overall, or how many they have in one location and follow up. Just want to add to that too. One of the differences between the two companies. So the Fab Doc, they don't currently have any rep sales representatives in the U.S. So their rep actually flies out here every time <laughs> we purchase a unit, and he's very hands-on and very helpful. Um, and with C Pen, they even though they're based in Australia, they do have a sales representative who's on the East Coast in Florida. So they're more established on the East Coast because there's more demand. And yeah, as Brenda said, they are interested in expanding um, to California, but they just want to make sure that the de demand is there so that they can have the um, appropriate level of services available. Yeah, as um, a representative for California's non-point source grant program, you know, we've had grants before with Marina del, Marina del Rey to have inflatable boat docks. And it's really, th those that grant didn't necessarily go well, but it's really exciting to see that this technology is advancing and that the, um, the capabilities of these companies to service uh, marinas at scale is improving. And it's really exciting for what we could do in the future. Yeah, and it, it is interesting, like with, you know, grants, if you were to plop 200 of these in one marina, you do have to think about who's there to service them. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, you have to think about the whole, the whole big picture for, for, for that. Yeah. Hi, Brenda. This is Chris. I just had a quick question. I, I heard you say that it, it's like five minutes or so, five to 10 minutes to inflate and deflate the units. Yes. Is that Three pretty consistent? I'm just trying to think logistically, you know, how to sell it to more boaters because a lot of times, you know, boaters are ready to roll and, and don't want to spend more time at the dock, right? But um, I think that would yes. be something. Actually, yeah, yeah. So it takes three, yeah, three to five minutes. And, but I do believe they're coming up with, ways where you could start the, like if you would like if you're approaching your marina and your slip and you can start it with your phone and then and then it'll be ready oh. by the time that you get there or or something similar like that yeah okay okay no that's cool i mean you know, 
doing uh, inflating and deflating it while you're unloading the boat and loading it and that kind of thing. So it seems like it's uh, pretty quick. Yeah, and it's something really interesting that, and I've seen images for both, but in person for the, the when we did the fab dock demonstrations, you, you can not only get on the boat while it's in these devices, like that's perfectly fine, which is great because when we were looking into boat lifts, that was a concern that stakeholders were bringing up was that they like to go on their boats and, you know, have friends and hang out. And if it's on a boat lift, you know, that makes it difficult. But these, because they're at the waterline, you can not only just be on the boat, you can walk around, <laughs> you can walk the device and walk around it. And, and we've saw, seen that in person. And so that's, that's nice. And at least addresses that, that issue that we've heard of for, for other devices. Yeah. Very cool. I guess the other question was, if do you have residual water left over that, you know, could still get a little bit algae growth or, you know, whatever after it's pumped out or how do you deal with that? So the pump uh, does turn on if it senses water. So that's how it works for like the rain mode when, um, so if it starts raining and it, if it senses the water, then the pump will turn on. Okay, so it's pretty good about not leaving puddles in certain parts of it or whatever. So, okay. Yeah. Very good. Cool. <laughs> Michael? Hey there. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm coming out of the darkness here. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Brenda. Uh, Hi. Yeah, I have a question about the, um, the extension on the back. How, how, how long? What's the extension that adds to the slip length uh, that would be additional uh, cost to the to the owner to rent that slip space if it adds a couple feet off the back? I think some of the other ones were two feet, but I wanted to see what this one was. This particular one, do you have that info? Um, I don't have the that info now. Okay, cool. Yeah. Up, but that was, you know, that would add to the cost of. Okay, look. Um, also, uh, is there a life expectancy on these? On these, and is there a warranty on the? On the, um, I know there was one that had a liner that that had to be replaced more often than 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 that. But I think this is a different model. Is there a life expectancy of of these things um, on on the on the actual physical um, container? Do they have a, an estimate on that? Yes, we've asked about that. And uh, be, the one company that started in the 90s said they've seen them in the, they've seen them functional for 10, 15 years. And um, the other company as well has been said 15 years plus. And so, yeah. Are they, how, what's the warranty on these? Oh, the warranty, oh, I, I don't have an answer for that, but I can follow up with you on that. Yeah, that'll be, and also the, um, the pump. That was another question that some folks have brought up. The warranty on the pump or life expectancy on the pump as far as replacing that. But just something that might, I think that would be, that would be asked. Um, yeah, because I, you know, I just heard different, different models that we've seen over the years have had different faults with the liner ripping before the outer shell rips and have to replace the liner and then the pump burning out and that need to be replaced. But it sounds like they're dialing it in. So if that information is available, that would be nice to have if, if you can get that from them. Boy, these Australians are on it, man. They're really uh, bringing it to us, huh? I'm getting it all sorts of... <laughs> you know, they care about the marine life, you know? There's a lot of, you know, really great marine life in Australia. And they want to, from talking with the, both companies, they want to make sure they, they're worried about the quality of water and they want to find alternatives to copper paint. So it's been, it's been inspiring to, to, that the companies care about, about the environment and not just about making money. You know, those were the, the questions I had. The size, the uh, warranties, the life expectancy, that kind of stuff, but yeah. And Morel, I don't know if, um, if you're able to address or speak to at all the extension of the device past whatever slip length that they, they have and if that has any impact on, on renting a slip. You know, I would have to check on that too. Michael, we can get back to you on some of these yeah. questions. It, it, that's, that's, you know, the guys will be asking those kinds of questions around the docks and stuff, but yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you.
Any other questions? I was just going to say, Merle and Brenda, if you get the answers to those questions, I'd be happy to include them um, on the meeting notes so that everybody can get the answers to those questions too. Great. Yep. Sounds good. And if you, if any of you think of any other questions, you know, during the call or after, um, feel free to email us and we can include those answers in there as well. All right. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Morel. That was terrific. Okay. And uh, next we're gonna have a presentation from Jun Zhu. I have to apologize, I mislabeled his presentation name. So it says <laughs> on the, here, I'll pull it up. Um, let's go, here we go. So this is not Coastal Sediment Management Work Group. Um, this is actually a presentation on the Los Angeles Regional Board uh, Non-Point Source Programs five-year plan overview. And uh, this is actually a really important presentation because uh, you guys, our stakeholders, have uh, requested more information about this in the past, and um, we're trying now to, uh, you know, um, bridge that knowledge gap um, and uh, fill you guys in on uh, the information that was requested. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to uh, share. I'm going to share my screen and let June uh, do all the talking. Just one second. Let's see. Let's go. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you good. Okay, great. Let's see. Let's see. Everybody can see that? Yeah, I can see my slide. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is June, Chief of the TMDL Non-Point Source Unit at the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, this is my second MIAC meeting. Um, at the last one, um, there was a request for, um, for staff, right, to talk about the Los Angeles Water Board 20 to 25 Non-Point Source Program Implementation Plan. Um, so today I will give you a presentation on the program areas in our non-point source program five-year plan. And um, hopefully this will help clarify any confusion. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Next slide, please. So to um, have you better oriented? I took this map from the previous, right, California Non-Point Source Program Implementation Plan um, between 2014 and 2020, um, which shows the, um, the three um, co-lead agencies, okay? So you have um, State Water Resource Control Board office location, which is the star here on um, Main Sacramento. And then you have the nine um, Regional Water Quality Control Board's office locations, which are dark brown circles throughout California, and um, California Coastal Commission office locations, um, which are the blue dots along the coastline. Um, so in this map, you can you know, also see each of the regional water quality control board's jurisdictional areas, right, and the boundary lines. So for example, the century of uh, the Central Valley um, region uh, is split into three subregions with offices in Redding and Rancho Cordova and Fresno, right? Um, and for us, the Los Angeles region covers uh, Ventura County and Los Angeles County. So the California five-year non-point source program um, implementation plan was prepared by the three agencies I mentioned um, uh, earlier. So the state board, the regional boards, and the Coast Commission, um, collectively, they were referred to as co-lead agencies. Um, so the goal of the five-year plan is to present the general goals, right, of and objectives of the co-lead agencies for addressing non-point source pollution between July 2020 and June 2025. Next slide, please. So this slide here shows the history of the statewide non-point source information plan program areas. Um, as you can see here, the program areas of the non-point source program evolved over time. Um, initially, 
between 2000 and 2013, um, there were six program areas, right, listed here, including agriculture, forestry, urban runoff, and so on. And then between 2014 and 2020, more program areas were added, um, such as non-point source related TMDL implementation programs. Regional boards start to branch out into other um, program areas as well, um, such as trash and contaminated sediment. And then um, in the 2020 and 2025 non-point source implementation plan, the program area list um, expanded again, right? Um, and included um, areas such as harmful algal bloom and climate change, resiliency, okay? Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this figure was taken from the um, water quality control plan or the basin plan of the Los Angeles Water Board. And it shows um, the watershed management areas in the region. Um, so from the west to the east, you will um, have Ventura River um, watershed, right? Um, and then shaded areas, um, these are miscellaneous Ventura coastal streams, watershed management area. And then you have Santa Clara River um, watershed, um, Cayugas Creek watershed, um, Santa Monica Bay watershed man uh, management area, and then Los Angeles River watershed, Domingos Channel watershed, Los Ritos Channel watershed, and San Gabriel River watershed. As you can see, the Los Angeles Water Board has jurisdiction over all coastal drainages flowing to the Pacific Ocean between um, the Rincon Point, um, just on the west side of Ventura County, and the eastern Los Angeles County line, as well as the five um, coastal islands drainages, right? So including Anacapa, San Nicolas, um, San uh, Santa Barbara, uh, Santa Catalina, and San Clemente, which are shown here in the inset. Um, next slide, please. So this figure here um, was also taken from the water quality control plan or the basin plan of the Los Angeles Water Board, and it shows the major land use categories in the region. Um, with more than 10 million residents, the Los Angeles region is one, it's actually the most densely populated region in the state, um, despite the large number of dischargers and highly industrialized nature of some of the watersheds, um, land use within the region is actually quite diverse, um, you know, in the uh, in this map, you can see different shades, uh, different colors here, um, representing different land use types. So um, agriculture and open space exists alongside urban, residential, commercial, and industrial areas. So some of the main um, surface water quality issues in our region include aquatic life and wildlife habitat threatened by elevated levels of toxic pollutants, right? Contaminated sediments and trash and increased nutrient loading and um, eutrophication conditions. Um, in order to address these surface water quality issues, um, our board has prioritized several programmatic um, activities. Since the late 1990s, our board has focused on the TMDL adoption, and as a result, we have adopted over 50 TMDLs in our region. So in the years to come still, um, we will focus on in, uh, implementing these TMDLs. Um, we will continue to oversee and enforce the wastewater permits, right, such as the MS4 permit in our region, which incorporated the TMDL waste load allocations. We will also continue our effort to reduce pollution loading from non-point sources such as agriculture activities and other non-point source, um, um, non sources through um, waste discharge requirements or WDRs, right, or conditional waivers of WDRs or other regulatory instruments which incorporated the TMDL load allocations. Next slide, please. Um, this slide here lists the Los Angeles region non-point source area, a uh, program areas during the 2014 and 2020 period and during the current 2020 to 2025 period. Between 2014 and 2020, um, our board focused on the following non-point source program areas, including irrigated agriculture, grazing and horse intensive livestock, contaminated sediment remediation, and trash. 
um, between 2020, 2020 and 2025, um, our board will continue to focus on the first three program areas on the list. Um, in addition, uh, we added um, coastal non-point source pollution control marina and the implementation of Malibu Creek and lagoon sediment and nutrient TMDL. So in the next few slides, I will dive into each of those five program areas and explain in details. Next slide, please. So program area one is irrigated agriculture, um, which has two sub areas. The first sub area is irrigated lands waiver. Discharges from agriculture activities have been regulated under a conditional waiver of discharge, uh, waste discharge requirements or WDRs um, from irrigated lands since 2005. The intent of our um, ag waiver, if you will, is to attain and maintain water quality benchmarks in the receiving waters by regulating the discharges from irrigated agricultural lands. So in October 2016, the board renewed an irriga uh, the irrigated lands waiver um, that continues to require agriculture discharges to um, one, enroll in the program, two, conduct water quality monitoring, and three, develop a water quality management plan to implement management practices to either attain or maintain the water quality benchmarks. The implementation of the irrigated um, lands waiver is an iterative process of management practice implementation, monitoring, and upgrading to completely address pollution from agricultural resource, uh, sources. Oversight of the um, irrigated lands waiver includes documentation of enrolled uh, acreage, um, education workshops, outreach activities, and management practice implementation. The irrigated lands waiver was extended um, in April uh, this year for one year and will be renewed um, in next April, right, in 2020, uh, 2022. Next slide, please. So the second um, sub-program area is Ventura River watershed, groundwater, surface water, hydrology, and nutrient transport models. Um, so in 2012, um, the Los Angeles Water Board adopted a TMDL for algae, eutrophic conditions, and um, nutrients in the Ventura River watershed. At the time of the TMDL development, a source assessment for the agricultural discharge of nutrients to surface water via groundwater flow was not achievable. Then in 2014, Ventura River was identified as one of the five priority stream systems in California Water Action Plan for um, development of new stream flow requirements. So to support potential TMDL reconsideration and the stream in stream flow requirements, the Los Angeles Water Board has been working with the state board to develop integrated groundwater surface water hydrology and nutrient transport models for the Ventura River watershed to provide scientifically defensible, cost-effective, time-sensitive, and uh, publicly transparent tool. We actually just had a series of three webinars right lately on that um, effort. Um, so the hydrology portion of the surface water groundwater interaction uh, model um, shall assist the state board in establishing stream flow criteria that support critical habitat for andronomous fish in the watershed. And then the nutrient transport um, portion of the model shall assist um, the regional board by refining information related to the source assessment and load allocations for agriculture sources in the Ventura River algae TMDL. Next slide, please. Okay, so the second program area is grazing and horse intensive livestock. Um, there are also two uh, sub-program areas. The first sub-program area is grazing. Um, grazing activities were identified as one of the non-point source, um, uh, non sources of nutrient and assigned load allocation in the Ventura River watershed LGTM deal. The compliance date for the load allocation is June 20th, 2023, um, which is 10 years after the effective day of the TMDL. Um, and then the load allocation requires a 10% reduction from the baseline loading of nutrients from grazing activities. Next slide, please. Then the second um, sub-program area is horse and intensive livestock. 
um, horse intensive livestock activities were also identified as non point source of nutrient in the Ventura River algae TMDL. Um, there are approximately 650 horse and intensive livestock facilities in Ventura River watershed. Um, and these facilities generate manure and other wastes containing nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus and other constituents that upon discharge to the waters of the state can degrade water quality and impair beneficial uses if these sources are not properly managed. Um, so the compliance date for um, the load allocation assigned to horses and um, intensive livestock facilities is also June 20th, 2023, 10 years after the effective day of the TMDL. Um, so the board staff has been, we have been working with the Horse and Livestock Watershed Alliance, um, a third party group to help, uh, to help facilities comply with the load allocation. Next slide, please. Now, the third program area is contaminated sediment remediation. Um, there are three sub-program areas. Um, the first one is McGrath Lake. So the McGrath Lake P uh, PCBs and pesticides and sediment, uh, sediment uh, toxicity TMDL became effective on June 30th, 2011. Um, lake sediment was identified as one of the main non-point source of legacy pollutants to the lake. So the TMDL assigned load allocations to the lake sediments and allowed for implementation through a voluntary memorandum of agreement or MOA. Um, so the Water Board and the cooperative, cooperative parties executed an MOA in May 2015, which included provisions for the development of the McGrath Lake work plan to remediate the lake sediment. Um, so the load allocation uh, shall be achieved by June 30th, 2025. Next slide, please. Then the second sub-program area is Marina del Rey Harbor. Um, so the revision of the Marina del Rey Harbor Toxic Pollutants TMDL became effective in 2015. Um, in harbor sediment was identified as one of the main non-point sources of toxic pollutants for the marina. Um, the board and the County of Los Angeles executed an MOA in 2017 for the Marina del Rey Toxics TMDL. The MOA requires the county to submit a contaminated sediment management plan by December 2019, which shall contain a timely and interim milestones to ensure that the sediment alloc uh, load allocations um, are achieved by the TMDL deadline of March 22, 2029. Next slide, please. Now, the last sub area in this category is Santa Clara River lakes, um, which include um, Elizabeth Lake, Lake Hughes, and Munts Lake. So, Santa Clara River lakes um, nutrient TMDL became effective in June 2017. Um, the internal loading from the lake sediment was identified as the main non point source of nutrients in the lakes. Um, Cooperative parties for the lake um, sediment load allocations were identified as the landowners of the lakes. Um, so the load allocations for the internal loading will be implemented um, in the same manner I right, described above, um, either um, as the memorandum of agreement, right, MOA, or a cleanup and abatement order or other regulatory order approved by the executive officer of the Los Angeles Water Board. So the internal loading um, allocation for total nitrogen and total phosphorus shall be attained um, uh, the allocation shall be attained by June 27th, 2032. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the fourth program area is coastal non-point source pollution control in the marinas. Um, the first sub area is Marina del Rey Harbor. The revision of the Marina del Rey toxics TMDL um, in, uh, became a effective in, uh, again in 2015, October 2015, um, dissolved copper in the water column uh, through discharge of dissolved copper from boats was identified as one of the main non-point sources of copper. The load allocation for discharges of dissolved copper from boats is a 85% reduction. So um, there are different means, right, to achieve the compliance. Um, so you can just meet the numeric target of copper in the water column, right? Or demonstrate that 85% of the boats in the harbor are using copper-free hull paints. Or um, 
um, or any other right, means as approved by the executive officer of the Los Angeles Water Board, which would result in the attainment of copper num numeric targets in the water column, such as demonstrating that 100% of the boats in the harbor are using hull paint that discharges 85% less copper than the baseline load. Okay, so the compliance date for the load allocations for discharges of copper from the boats is March 22nd, 2024. Next slide, please. So the second sub area um, is other marinas in the region. Um, so biocides are also used in the hull paint for boats residing in other marinas in the region, such as Los, um, uh, the Los Angeles and Long Beach Harbor, right? Um, the um, Alameda Bay Channel Harbor, Channel Island, sorry, Channel Island Harbor, um, King Harbor, and uh, Ventura Harbor, Ventura Keys. Although not all of these marinas are subject to TMDLs, the Los Angeles Water Board intends to regulate these marinas in the same manner as Marina del Rey Harbor to maintain the consistency in compliance requirements. In order to, I'm sorry, in, 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 in accordance with the um, non-point source implementation policy, discharges of biocides from boats residing um, in Los Angeles Vent Ventura County marinas shall be regulated by either a um, waste discharge requirement or waivers of discharge requirement or other regulatory mechanisms. Okay, next slide, please. So the last program area is, is specific to the implementation of the Malibu Creek Nutrient TMDL. Okay, so there are two actually TMDLs here, um, both of which were developed by the US EPA. So the Malibu Creek Watershed Nutrient TMDLs, or the 2003 TMDL, became effective in 2003 to address impairments due to ammonia nutrients, dissolved oxygen, algae, scum, and odor in Malibu Lagoon, Malibu Creek, and its tributaries, and four lakes in the watershed. And then in 2013, the Malibu Creek and Lagoon Sedimentation and Nutrients TMDL um, to address benthic community impairments became effective in July 2013 um, to address impairments in Malibu Creek and Las Virgenes Creek related to imp uh, impacted benthic microinvertebrates and sediment siltation and impairments of Malibu Lagoon related to um, adverse benthic community effects. Um, both TMDLs, again, they were established by the US EPA. Um, the implementation plan for these two TMDLs um, became effective in 2017, which laid out the, um, the schedule so I, and the plan for those two TMDLs. So in these two TMDLs, both um, livestock sources and golf courses actually in the area were identified as one of the non-point sources, right? Um, and um, which can be regulated by, uh, again, waste discharge requirements or conditional waivers of WDRs or other regulatory mechanisms um, approved by the executive officer of the Los Angeles Water Board. Next slide, please. So I would like to end my presentation with this slide here, um, showing the water body pollutant combinations addressed in the 2020 and 2025 Los Angeles Region on Point Source Implementation Plan. On the left, you have the water bodies, and on the right, you have the pollutants um, associated with these water bodies. And um, hopefully our implementation plan will address all of these water body and pollutant combination to achieve water quality objectives. With that, um, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Can you still hear me? We can hear you, Jim. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> For a second, I was thinking, I was talking to myself the whole time. Okay, um, great. Uh, it looks like, uh, Michael, do you have your hand up? Yes, and I had my video on, but not my, my audio. Sorry about that. Um, I had a, a quick question. How will we confirm <laughs> boaters the, the amount of uh, conversion to non-toxic hull paint? You mentioned that um, 
a certain percentage could be reached if we could confirm that the voters are using it. How would we go about doing that? How would that be accomplished? I'm curious. Is that boots on the ground and inspecting each boat? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it would be, you know, we have been working with the county of Los Angeles, right? Um, I think the first uh, talk by the county actually laid out some of those um, programs that the county have been um, implementing to achieve the water quality objectives. Um, so, yeah, we'll be closely working with the county again to um, help the voters um, with the conversion and identify the um, viable pains. Um, yeah. So it's a work in progress. So we don't know. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. It just seems well, great. it would be great to be able to confirm that. But, you know, yeah, I'm just curious as, as how you approach that, how that, how that would be accomplished on both, you know, inspection. I, I, I don't know. Right. Yeah, yeah. So we have been working on a waiver. Um, so as I mentioned, so the waste discharge requirements um, uh is a tool to regulate non-point sources, right? Um, and we also have conditional waiver of those waste discharge requirements, um, which is another tool we could use to regulate the non-point sources. And I, I, we, the regional board has been working on a waiver, um, uh, which is right now we are actually going through the internal review. Um, and in the waiver, we have certain conditions, monitoring requirements and um, provisions being set um, to basically help, right, achieve the water quality objective. I got you. And that, and that, and that, and that would include. So yeah. So you know, I think that will have some enforcement or um, regulatory um, mechanism, right? So because. Mm -hmm. When I was talking about we were working with the county and the county would help the voters to identify the paint and help with the switch. And so um, it's, you know, it's pretty much voluntary. Um, and the, the TMDL is a planning tool. Um, it doesn't really, um, it became, you know, uh, a um, enforcement mechanism when it's incorporated into permits and waivers and waste, uh, waste discharge requirements. So, um, yeah, so we are working on that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hello. Hi. Yeah, this is this is Neil Blossom. I have a question um, about the TMDLs and and uh, yeah. just getting getting some of these water bodies off the 303D list. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's, my, my, it's my understanding that that can occur yeah. uh, if there isn't degradation of the biological populations, that that's another way of getting off of the TMDL. Uh, is, is that something that's being considered? Um, let's see. I think there, there are two um, parts of the answer to your question. The first part is, um, 303D program and the TMDL program, they are two separate programs. Um, so you could have a water body still being regulated under a TMDL, um, but it could be delisted, right? So the delisting wouldn't really affect um, the TMDL, actually. Um, so whatever is on the TMDL's implementation schedule is still effective. Um, so that's one thing. But then uh, you brought up a good point. So if in the future, the water quality has you know, been improved and um, so according to the listing policy, we, there, are, there are certain threshold right, of um, clean samples, if you will. So um, to really, um, so there are criteria um, nonetheless um, in the listing policy, which could um, uh, be achieved. And, and then at that point we could, you know, make a recommendation and delist that water body down the road. Yeah. Which would, you know, again, will be approved by the state board and the US EPA eventually. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Yeah. No problem. Any other questions?
I thought we had another hand up earlier, mm -hmm. but I think yeah. it went back down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That might be still mine. Sorry, I'm taking it down. There we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions, you know, via email or uh, we can set up calls or, um, and soon we'll be back into the office. We can meet in person. So yeah, um, it's a five-year plan. It's a planning document. Um, and uh, sometimes plans do get changed um, depending on the priority of the board. And, um, you know, with COVID or um, their unexpected events or, so yeah, just keep that in mind as well. Uh, I, I saw Colin Anderson's hand up just for a second. Or, okay. Yeah. Yep. Hey Colin, I think you're unmuted. Hmm. Are you there, Colin? I think his microphone might not be working. Colin, if you have a question and you can't verbally communicate it, feel free to email me. Um, my okay. email is at the very beginning of the agenda. It's also michael.hanks at waterboards.ca.gov. Um, yeah. I, this is Neil Blossom. I think I might know his question. It might be, does the Water Quality Control Board differentiate between dissolved copper and copper that is complex and not available biologically? That might be his question. Or, um, well, the TMDL is very specific, right? So we're talking about the dissolved copper and we identify the main source um, being the boats um, and um, according to staff's um, calculation at the time and you know 85 percent reduction is needed to achieve the water quality objective um, so yes so it is very specific to dissolved um, uh, form of copper only yeah and for sediment we do have a different right allocation and which is essentially covered in program area three um, and yeah, so. Actually, uh, this is Michael Quilligan. I do have another question. This may yep. be well off topic, but I've, it's always been in the back okay. of my And maybe you can answer this, June. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, there had been talk of aerating, doing some aeration in the back harbor, back mm -hmm. area and uh and getting in water to circulate is that, yeah. is that being spoken of anymore or is that on the back burner or is that outside of this of, of your knowledge um i kind of wanted to defer that question to the county but um the aeration would help with for example do right dissolved oxygen right. Yeah. or um i think um, in some other um areas in the region we have you know, algal bloom issues or um, fish die off or uh, stagnant water, um, I think aeration could help. With dissolved copper though, I don't think it'll help too much. Um, no. The circulation itself perhaps could um, help with, um, you probably could bring the dilution factor, um, but it wouldn't, um, the copper won't go away, <laughs> really. Uh, no. um, <laughs> Yeah. So um, the copper is only one part of the problem, and you know, that's, it's just yeah, other areas. And and another topic, since I've got the floor mm -hmm. here, yep, Ray has held his hand. I'm sure he's got some things to throw down. Um, the the influx of boats from say other countries uh, mm -hmm. during COVID in the marina was pretty extensive, and I, I'm just curious how the heck could we could possibly regulate. Uh, in the marinas and you know what kind of uh what kind of uh boat based boat bottom paint they're using and how that influences our, our water qualities you know was, i didn't even think about that i think it was greg from the boat yard brought that up i was just curious yeah did you mean from other counties right i i, I think i heard other countries yeah, people that were you couldn't go into couldn't had to stay in the marina because they couldn't take their yeah massive yachts into other countries during COVID. And I did not even think about it, of how, how the leaching of the copper could affect our water quality. But I, I mean, 
I, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you if you have any thoughts on that. I know it's out outside the realm of. So um, do you know the number of the boats coming in yeah. from different you know, places? Brother, have you been, go down to the marina and see what was going on this summer. I can't even tell you. I mean, mm. we'll have a lot of money. I'll tell you that. And So, yeah. So the 85% reduction, you know, you know out of some, sorry. Uh, first of all, I would love to go down the marina in the summer and meet with you in person. Um, I don't think we have met yet. Um, so the calculation was based on 4,000, what is it, 700-ish boats um, in the marina, um, which you know, will need require 85% uh, reduction. Um, so, which is why I'm asking, you know, if you know the the numbers we're, you know, talking about from other places, um, you might not have that that the same magnitude, right? So, oh, I'm, just, I'm just anecdotal standing mm, on the okay, <laughs> yeah, but there's, you know, I think that sort of you sort of bring bring up a good point where you know in the program area too we wanted to regulate other marinas you know in the same manner we we regulate marina dare such that we wanted to keep the consistency right in our regulation and such you know so that we don't have boats escaping marina dare for example and you know go to um king harbor or i don't know um you know in the area so as long as we have a consistent regulation and mechanism in place. So yeah, I think it's better for everybody um, to have a consistent, yeah, to some, have some consistency. Um, yeah. right. well, but, let's, let's um, mm -hmm. change emails and, and, we'll, and we'll talk. Absolutely, yeah. Right. Yep, mm -hmm. no, no problem. And uh, we are also, you know, we like to work with the county and with the boaters too. And um, since Michael is here, we would like to, you know, provide hopefully, you know, funding through RFB 19 uh, non-point source grant um, to help uh, um, offset some of the, those costs, right? Um, for example, for 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 paint switch and um, yeah. Although it, it is a competitive process and there's no guarantee that we will be able to get the money, but um, I'm open to uh, the idea of getting the application in and Region 4 will support that effort. Yeah. Yeah, the state board will support, the state board where we approve the non-point source grants support yeah. those applications as well. That's great. So th this is this is uh, Ray Heimstra. I just had a, a couple things. One, since you just mentioned the 319H, I kind of wanted to uh, throw it out there. Last last time uh, we had this meeting, I mentioned that uh, Orange County Coast Keeper, uh, Ray Heimster with Orange County Coast Keeper, we had applied for a 319H grant for non-paint uh, BMP implementation for copper reduction in Newport Bay. Um, we submitted that. Unfortunately, we weren't selected as uh, Michael mentioned, it's a competitive process, but we were specifically told that 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 kind of BMPs, at least the way we wrote it, was it didn't have a specific enough uh, water quality improvement quantification to. So just be aware of that if you're thinking of that. And then the other thing is, uh, I'm wondering if you're thinking of extending the TMDL deadline. You've got a 10-year TMDL deadline. In my region, they they like to establish the you know endless TMDL deadlines, and then when the deadline shows up, you know they just rewrite the TMDL and. So what what are you, what are your what are your thoughts on extending the TM? Is that already in your thought process? That's a good question. Um, so our region might be a little bit unique in that sense, where you know, compelled by the consent decree, right in the late '90s, we had a um, I think for most of our TMDLs, we had a 13-year implementation um, schedule to achieve water quality um, objectives. Um, so at the time we you know, so 50-ish TMDL were, were written and developed. And um, so, as you know, I think a TMDL is a very comprehensive study, really. It's a planning tool, and we look at different point sources of different non-point sources, and um, staff, uh, the staff will use our best, you know, professional judgment to um, to identify these sources and assign load allocations and waste load allocations and develop um, a implementation schedule as a guidance for the um, dischargers to, to basically comply right, with um, those allocations. Um, 
we have been revisiting right, some of those TMDLs, as you can see, um, I think on our, on our website, we do have several revisions and um, some of it you know, has to do with perhaps we have special studies to help, to help us better understand um, the, the, the source assessment. And um, other times we have statewide objectives. Um, for example, more recently, we have the trash objectives and which compelled our region to look at some of our trash TMDLs. And we um, then adopted um, revisions of those trash TMDLs. Um, Marina DRA, you know, toxic TMDL also gone through revisions, right? The first, I think, um, um, edition was, um, uh, I think was in 2005, that was when the first TMDL um, became effective. And then in 2015, the revision became effective, uh, which set this new schedule. Um, yeah, I think re revision of this revision is still on the table as well. Um, and I think recently um, our, our board, right, um, actually in March, we adopted um, the revisions of nine TMDLs, um, extending the MS4 discharges uh, implementation schedules, um, largely due to COVID, but also we consider how far along they have implemented uh, those measures um, to really um, address the point sources um, in uh, identified in those TMDLs. So um, yeah, I think in the coming years, we will be looking to as to um, whether it's uh, appropriate to reconsider the implementation schedule and county actually has been doing a site specific objective study, um, which I think our next talk is about. Um, and so Ashley Parks will be talking about the results from the study, which will help um, refine right um, the water quality object. Uh, objectives. Um, so I don't want to steal Ashley's thunder, but um, is it really, um, uh, I guess, is our water quality objective, current water um, quality objective is, 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 is reasonable or practical for Marina Dare? So that was a big question. So yeah, um, so there's different aspects of um, that we will look into um, before we reconsider um, this TMDL. Um, but it's certainly yeah, on the table for us to consider. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, Region 8 is uh, supposedly our copper TMDLs on the table for mm -hmm. adoption this year. And they, they, they haven't pursued a site-specific objective uh, in that area yet. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, we are right on time. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, June. Um, no problem. You definitely earn your paycheck today by answering all these questions. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I think that's, I think we're going to stop this presentation. Um, let's see. And we are scheduled for a five minute break. Um, and so I think we're going to do that. Um, Let's meet back here at uh, 1025. Um, you guys can go ahead and talk amongst yourself if, you, if you'd like to stay on the line. Um, but um, yeah, let's just take a five minute break.
Okay, it is 1025 and it looks like we didn't lose anybody uh, during our five minute break. Uh, so I'm happy to hear that. Um, next up, we have a presentation uh, from Ashley Parks uh, from Southern California Coastal Water Research Project for the Marina Del Rey, Hopper, <laughs> Marina Del Rey Harbor Water Effects Ratio Study. Uh, Ashley, are you on the line? Yes. Awesome. And would you like to share your screen? Sure. Okay. All right. Are you seeing my title slide? Yeah. Yeah, you look good. Okay. That looks perfect. good. Yeah. Great. Um, well, yeah, uh, as Mike said, uh, I'm Ashley Parks. I'm from uh, Squirp. I'm a toxicologist here, and I've been working on this water effect ratio study in Marina Del Rey Harbor um, since we started it a few years ago. So we're just about wrapping up the project. Uh, we're planning to submit our final technical report uh, for the, the WER study by the end of this month. So we're in sort of the final revisions. Um, so I'm excited to share with you all uh, sort of the, the findings from this study. All right, so today I'm gonna give you, you know, a brief overview of the study, our objectives, the uh, sampling and testing design, as well as our study results. So first I just wanna thank um, Morale, Brenda, and June for basically giving all the background information for this study. Uh, so it's nice to go after all of you today. Um, but as uh, June had mentioned, we have the TMDL uh, in Marina Del Rey Harbor uh, for copper uh, in the water column. So the current uh, criterion is 3.1 micrograms per liter. Um, and so really this, what this study is doing is performing a water effect ratio study to determine if that 3.1 micrograms per liter is uh, appropriate or if it could possibly be modified. Uh, based on the site-specific water characteristics in Marina Del Rey Harbor. Uh, so this site-specific objective study was approved, um, and we worked with a technical advisory committee to help design uh, the study. Uh, we also um, sought out stakeholder input and review of both the work plan, study design, and um, had uh, invited stakeholders to our data review process. Uh, with the, the TAC members as well. So I wanna thank everyone who's participated so far. Uh, we've really appreciated your input, um, comments, questions, suggestions, everything. So thank you for that. All right, so for our uh, site-specific objective study, firstly, we wanted to characterize the water quality parameters in Marina Del Rey Harbor. So we wanted to get a better idea of, you know, what are the dissolved copper concentrations in the harbor? Does it vary by basin location, front basins, back basins, main channel, those sorts of questions. Uh, we also wanted to look at dissolved organic carbon content of the water uh, and just, you know, just get a better sense of water quality. You know, what's the pH range? What's the salinity range? How's the dissolved oxygen? Uh, measurements like that. And then the overall goal of the study was to generate a water effect ratio. So I'll further define this, um, but the plan was to use up to six different sampling events under different water quality conditions. So we wanted to make sure that we really got a representative sample uh, of Marina Del Rey Harbor water uh, to ensure that we were really capturing the variability in the harbor uh, and just, you know, we're able to represent the conditions in the harbor uh, for this water effect ratio. So this, uh, the six sampling events included both winter and summer dry weather sampling events, uh, wet weather events, and then we also sampled at both spring and NEEP tidal cycles. Okay, so now I'll get more into the details of the sampling and testing design. So as I mentioned before, we had six sampling events. So this is a table uh, sort of describing the different characteristics we were hoping to capture with the six sampling events. So we have tide type. So for the dry weather events, we wanted to capture both spring and neap tidal cycles. So spring tidal cycles, you have you know, the very high highs and low lows. Uh, so a much greater difference in your high and low tide. And then the neap tidal cycles are much shallower. Uh, so you have less uh, tidal flushing and less drastic changes uh, between your high and low tides. And so for each 
winter dry weather, we did one spring sampling, uh, spring tide sampling and one neap tide sampling. And then for wet weather, uh, we sampled two wet weather events. Uh, and in this case, we weren't paying attention to the tidal cycles. We just wanted to capture rain events when they happen since they're few and far between. <laughs> Uh, and then the numbers here sort of just correspond to the number, uh, the, the order in which we, we sampled them. Okay, so for our sampling locations, you know, we sort of covered the different types of sampling events uh, that we wanted to capture, but we also wanted to make sure that we were being spatially representative uh, within Marina Del Rey Harbor. So we wanted to make sure we had a main channel location. Um, so we have our main channel three location out here. And then we also wanted to cover both front and back basins. So we chose uh, basins A and B for our two front basins and basins E and F for our two back basins. Uh, so this you know, really covers our, our spatial representativeness. Um, and then it was during our work plan sort of planning meeting in December, 2018, uh, that we had some feedback about making sure that we were being uh, representative within a basin. Um, so sort of the initial talks were, you know, just collecting one sample within a basin. Um, but we discussed sort of increasing, you know, further increasing our spatial representativeness uh, by sampling three points for each basin. So for example, in basin B, we have our sort of innermost uh, section of the basin, a mid channel and an outer section of that basin. Uh, so essentially, um, all of these three areas in basin B were subsampled. Uh, so, you know, like if we had a bottle sample, we would fill it up a third of the way at B1, fill it up to the two thirds mark at B2, and fill it up completely at B3. So, we would have one bottle sample for basin B, but it would be made up of water from both the inner, mid, and outer portion of the basin. So, we did these uh, spatial composites for each of the four basin locations. And then for dry weather events, we wanted to capture not only, you know, looking at the spring tide event or a neap tide event, but what about when you have within a specific day, uh, you have your incoming and outgoing tides. So does that change, um, you know, the water quality? We wanted to be representative of that as well. So for dry sampling events, we sampled twice per day. So we went to each location twice. So Here's a graph of the tidal cycles for each of our sampling events. So I'm just going to focus up here on this first one, the WER1 summer dry weather neap tide. Uh, and so what you'll see here, we have our tide height on the y-axis and just the, the time of day on the x-axis. Um, and you'll see here, I have the, the letters of the station uh, overlaid on the graph. So we sampled MC3, A, B, E, F. Uh, this was sort of, you know, at the bottom of the outgoing tide, and then we sampled again at the incoming tide. Uh, you can see that here for WERT2. Again, we sampled first at the outgoing tide, and then sampled as soon as the tide started coming back in. Uh, so again, these samples were composited. So we have sort of our, our morning sample composites and our afternoon sample composites. And then for our final, uh, you know, sample collection, we combined the morning basin A sample with the afternoon basin A sample. And then that was our sort of completely composited basin A sample that we used for the toxicity testing and for the chemistry analysis. Uh, and then again, for the wet weather events, as I mentioned before, we didn't focus on spring or neap tides. Uh, we also didn't focus on tidal events. It was more just to capture uh, the wet weather event. So for each of these sampling events, we measured uh, multiple parameters. Some of them were in the field, some were in the laboratory, some of the parameters were uh, in both. So our field measurements, we always measured pH, temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. So these were done in the field uh, using a probe. Uh, we also measured those um, in the laboratory within our toxicity test. And we took bottle samples for dissolved organic carbon total and dissolved copper, total and dissolved zinc, and then our subsample that we used for our toxicity testing for the, the water friction ratio. Uh, for the toxicity testing, what we do is we create a dose response curve. 
Uh, so since we're interested in the copper toxicity and sort of how protective Marina del Rey Harbor water is in relation to dissolved copper, um, you have your sample that you take from the marina. That's essentially your zero copper concentration. So obviously we know that there's some baseline copper in the harbor samples, um, but we want to basically add more and more and more copper so that we see a full range of the dose um, response effect. Leave the next slide. Yes, so this will better sort of um, visualize that. So this is a dose response curve on the right. So for the muscle test that we used, uh, on the y-axis, you have your percent normal larval development. So 100%, say, would be in clean reference water. Uh, you would have, you know, zero, presumably zero copper. You'd have 100% normal embryos. And then as you increase the copper in your sample, you increase or you decrease the number of normal embryos. You increase the number of abnormal embryos, and you get this dose response curve. So this is what we were trying to uh, sort of simulate with Marina Del Rey Harbor water. So we have our reference water. Uh, we used the Granite Canyon reference water. So that's gonna look more like this gray line where you uh, start with you know, low copper concentrations because it's a nice clean reference water. And so you have high uh, normal larval development. And then as you go down, you have a bigger response. And then the Marina Del Rey water you know, it's uh, zero or no added copper is gonna have some background level of copper, uh, whether it be five or 10 micrograms per liter. And then we add more to the sample to uh, get this dose response effect. And what the water effect ratio calculation is, is essentially your effect concentration 50, so EC50. So that's where, you know, what is the copper concentration when you have 50% normal larval development. So we can calculate that value from these dose response curves. And so you take the Marina Del Rey water EC50 and you divide it by the EC50 in the reference water. So that's how we calculate a water effect ratio. And that's what we did for this study. So the water effect ratio can be interpreted many ways. Uh, you know, it's not a, a good or bad thing. Uh, it's just a number. So a water effect ratio of one would indicate that the Marina Del Rey water is equally protective as the reference water uh, when it comes to copper. If a water effect ratio is greater than one, so your EC50 of your Marina Del Rey water is higher than the reference water, then that means the Marina Del Rey water uh, you know, has site specific characteristics that make it a little bit more protective or it reduces the potency of the dissolved copper. And the opposite is true if your ratio is less than one. And that means the Marina Del Rey water increases the potency of dissolved copper uh, and it makes it more toxic. So this ratio can be used to develop a site-specific objective. Uh, so I'm gonna just be presenting the ratio results, um, but essentially what you would do to create a site-specific objective is you would take the criterion, which is currently 3.1 micrograms per liter, and you'd multiply it by your ratio. So like if your ratio is one, then your criterion doesn't change because the harbor waters are equally protective uh, as reference waters. So the current criterion uh, is effective. Okay, so that's the background on the sampling design and the testing design. So now I'm gonna show you get, uh, some results. So I'll start just with the big picture, uh, sort of the main findings of this study. So for all six sampling events, we found that dissolved copper concentrations frequently exceeded the current criterion of 3.1 micrograms per liter. Uh, the only location where that wasn't always the case was the main channel station. Uh, generally, our dissolved organic carbon concentrations were lowest in the winter dry weather uh, with the spring tide. Um, and then our water effect ratios typically were greater than one uh, and suggested that there was reduced copper bioavailability in Marina Del Rey Harbor waters. Um, the exact uh, ratio number is dependent on the season and weather. So whether it's uh, winter or summer or dry or wet weather. And generally our water effect ratio uh, numbers were higher in wet weather followed by summer dry weather and then we had the lowest uh, were values in winter dry weather. 
Okay, so here's a summary of the dissolved copper data um, from all six sampling events. So let me explain this graph real quick. We have dissolved copper concentration in micrograms per liter on the y-axis, and we have the different station locations on the x-axis. So GC is Granite Canyon. That was our reference water. Uh, main channel three is the main channel station, basin A, basin B, basin E, basin F. The blue lines, where it says site characterization minimum and maximum, that was some background sampling we did uh, prior to the were sampling, and this is just the range of copper concentrations um, we collected during that sampling. Uh, the SIMP minimum and maximum, the green lines, uh, that's the county's uh, monitoring program. And so uh, for the same time frame, basically from March 2018 um, to the end of 2020, that was the minimum and maximum copper concentrations measured in the SIMP program. Uh, and then I put the water quality criterion here as well as 3.1. So what you'll see is that the lowest copper concentrations are at the main channel location. Um, like I mentioned, they were frequently below the 3.1, but not always. And then the highest copper concentrations are at the basin stations uh, with were seven. Uh, sorry, I forgot to explain this. These are the different six different sampling events. So a different color and symbol type. Uh, the summer dry are the open circles and squares. The winter dry are the gray uh, diamonds and hexagons, and the wet weathers are the right side up and upside down triangles in black. Um, so we're seven, this gray uh, hexagon shape had the highest uh, copper concentrations of all the sampling events, and were two, which was the summer dry spring tide, had the lowest, um, with everything else sort of in between. But all of these copper concentrations were very similar to uh, what was observed in the monthly monitoring program as well. So I also have a summary of the dissolved organic carbon concentrations. So uh, similar setup with the graph, but instead on the y-axis we have DOC. Uh, and again, with the SIMP uh, DOC min and max. So uh, again, our samples uh, were similar to what the monthly monitoring program measured as well. Uh, our DOC concentrations were lowest in the WER7 event, which was the winter dry uh, spring tide event. And just in general, the DOC concentrations ranged from about 0.65 to 1.6. So this is really the table that summarizes all of the water effect ratios for the study. Uh, so again, we have station on uh, as each of the rows as a different station. Uh, each of the columns is a different sampling event. And then I have sort of a summary here that if you were to take all of the individual um, sampling events and stations, we could uh, calculate a geometric mean. So for WER1, uh, they range, they're typically around 1.3 for the water effect ratios. So the geometric mean is on the bottom. Um, so generally our lowest WERs we're in the winter dry weather. So we're six and seven. Um, winter dry weather, uh, we had the lowest words. So they were a geometric mean of one. I did not calculate a geometric mean for we're seven as only one of the stations we were able to calculate a geometric or a, a water effect ratio. So the dashed lines are basically where we either had too much background toxicity in this case, um, that you know the, the unspiked sample was less than 50% normal. So we can't calculate a dose response curve um, when there's so much background toxicity. So that's why we don't have individual WER numbers here. Um, but in general, the dry weather WERs for individual stations range from 0.93 to 1.44, and the wet weather, which I'd mentioned before were higher, uh, range from 1.54 to 2.04. Um, then if you took all of these individual numbers, so there's a total of 24 samples, uh, you could calculate a geometric mean of 1.4. This, like, all of these results suggest that uh, the Marina del Rey water is, is a little bit more protective than uh, sort of the, the reference water. So it could be appropriate to calculate a site-specific objective for Marina del Rey Harbor. I do wanna note that the technical advisory committee was split on how to calculate a final word uh, for this study. 
So um, previously, it's been done that you calculate a geometric mean of your sample burrs, uh, which would give you this 1.4 number. Um, some members in the TAC thought it might be appropriate to weight uh, the geometric mean by weather. So in this case, we had two of six events were wet weather events, which is roughly 33% uh, of our samples. Um, but in general, Southern California, we don't generally have 33% of our days where we have rain days. Um, so it might be more appropriate to weight this on a weather uh, basis. Um, but all of this will be summarized in our report, which should be out by the end of June. So in general, uh, based on these results, uh, you could calculate a final WER of 1.4 if you use the geometric mean of all of the sample WERs. Uh, and generally, this indicates uh, that the site conditions in Marina Del Rey Harbor reduce the toxic potency of copper uh, as the WER is greater than 1. So with that, uh, I will gladly take any questions. Hi, this this is Ray. Uh, could, who who was on the technical advisory team? Was that was that mostly water board staff, or was that was that was that other? Uh, I mean, not that they're not scientists, but other ac maybe academics or something like that. Uh, they were all academic researchers. Uh, so there was Peter Campbell, uh, Rich Ambrose, and Gary Chair. So they all had different specialties uh, that you know related to this project and were able to bring their expertise uh, in advising us, uh, not only in the work plan and sampling plan development, but also in the data review uh, and report review. Great, because I, 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 you know, I, I know that there's a lot of interest from folks, you know, on, on this, bio, you know, bioavailability question. So it sounds mm -hmm. like from what I've been, un, differently from what I've been hearing about Newport Beach, where the study hasn't been done, they, they seem to think that wouldn't help there, but it looks like Marina Del Rey, this a site-specific objective would be helpful. Yes, I, it's not going to solve the problem. Uh, as you saw, the copper concentrations, you know, could get up above 10 micrograms per liter. Uh, so a 1.4, if the final word was to be a 1.4, um, you're looking at a new site-specific objective of about 4.3. Um, so it will help, um, but there still needs to be a lot of reduction of copper in the water. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, go ahead. Hey, Chris, go for it. Oh, no, nice presentation. <laughs> so uh, it was really good to see that. It's consistent with what we've seen with some prior studies, too. Um, the question I have was more on the wet weather. So how connected were your sampling events to rain? And were they big rain events? Was it actually close? You know, did you see real influence in the harbor, like turbidity and other? I saw the DOC values, but, you know, was it? Uh, yeah. So we always sampled within 24 hours of the end of a rain event. And the TAC wanted to make sure that we did have a significant enough rain event. So it had to be at least half an inch. Um, so it was a bigger storm. Um, and we sampled you know, as soon as it stopped raining. Uh, and then we also, for the wet weather events, instead of just taking uh, the water quality, like the salinity PHDO, um, temperature measurements of sort of the sample that was taken a meter below the surface. We also measured those water quality parameters right at the surface so we could see, you know, if there was a change in salinity. And for the wet weather events, uh, there was at the surface water level, there was uh, even the one meter below, uh, there was a slight uh, reduction in salinity. So we were seeing uh, freshwater input from those um, rain events. Okay, no, that's cool. That's interesting. Okay, no, that answered that question. And it's been a challenge when you, you discussed that the, the TAC was discussing a geometric mean over the year versus seasonal. I mean, you have just these transient events that occur with the storm event that's, you know, short term. I guess I'd be curious what their thoughts were. Like, how would you apply a word, you know, under different seasons, you know, for something like this, where it's a standing yeah. body, <laughs> you know? We, we mostly discussed, you know, wanting to have a single number uh, for the harbor just because, yeah, implementation-wise, it could make it more difficult. 
Um, but so that was why they suggested possibly doing a weather weighted final were uh, instead of just essentially the, the geometric mean of all the samples would be like a sample weighted geometric mean. So instead oh. of doing that, doing a weather weighted uh, geometric mean. So like if you have 30 days of a 365 day year or wet weather days, um, then you would weight your wet weather samples as essentially roughly 10%. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. Interesting. All right. Very good. Thanks. Uh, it's uh, Michael Quill, Los Angeles Waterkeeper. I, um, I, I mean, I get a little off topic, but I, I, I just want to get a clearer understanding. I noticed that the, uh, the, the A Harbor, the A Marina and the back marinas were the ones sampled. And one of the most polluted areas is the D Marina, where the uh, uh, Mother's Beach is, where the degradation, you know, it's constantly um, a lower water quality. Would that affect uh, your, your data? Um, if, if that area were sampled, uh, would the, is the is the quality of water, the degradation of the water, does that influence the the copper um, results that you get, or is that just just um, not 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 anything that's uh, worth considering? Right. Um, so I mentioned the site characterization study we did. So that was three sampling events we did before we um, developed the the were sampling plan. And we actually went out and sampled, uh, I believe it was every single basin just to get some background water quality and dissolved copper and DOC data. Um, and we did not see any sort of drastic differences um, between the basins. I think in the front basins, we sometimes saw lower uh, uh, dissolved copper concentrations, but not, not significant, not, not the difference like the main channel versus the basin locations. Um, so that sort of played into which basins we selected. Um, if it's a bacteria issue in terms of water quality, that shouldn't impact um, the dissolved copper. That was my, that was my other question. I, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm working by, uh, by smell down here a lot mm -hmm. and the amount of sewage we've had in the marina this during COVID especially had been quite alarming. I didn't know whether that affected your results or not. And, and is there anyone doing that kind of um, sampling for basically fecal matter in the, in the water? And if so, how do I get those results? Um, I can't speak to that. I have not been involved in any projects doing that sampling. Um, I don't know if June or Morale could speak to that better. Would that would that affect the 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 test results? The the it would not the bacteria. No. Would, okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. If anybody has any kind of um, feedback on anyone that's testing for for that specific. Uh, um, it's just it's just something that has got my attention and and my uh, my slip mates attention and uh, we want to do some kind of outreach and I, I know that uh, Georgia and, and the Bay Foundation do as well so if we can come up with a game plan either to raise awareness and maybe get people to stop doing what they're doing but um, yeah if there's any kind of um, sampling that's being done save us some some leg work that anyone can share please let me know about the, specifically about the sewage in the marina. Yeah, Michael. Um, so to answer your previous question on the uh, bacteria data, I believe it's part of the SIMP monitoring effort. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so the county public works would have the data and then they also submit annual monitoring reports to us. Um, you could also actually go to CEDEN, um, C-E-D-N, if you just Google C-E-D-N, which is the California Environmental Data Network, uh, uh, Exchange Network. Um, I believe the data should be in CEDEN as well. It might take a while to um, navigate the website, um, but you will be able to get the data for sure you're looking for. Great, thank you so much. No problem. Hey, Jane, uh, this is Georgia from the Bay Foundation. Could you just repeat that? You said part of the which monitoring? No? CIMP, Coordinated Integrated Monitoring. Yeah, CIMP. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. No problem.
Ashley, this is Mike. Um, did you when did you say that final report is going to come out? Uh, so we're submitting the final report to the county at uh, the end of this month. Um, so I'm guessing it will come out shortly after. Uh, I know it will eventually be put up on the SQRP website. Uh, okay. But I think it's going to go through our internal review process uh, before okay. it's published on our website, but it will eventually be added on the website. Okay, and great. we will be holding um, a another public meeting later this summer as well. So that should be announced through um, the regional board's Lyris list. Okay, great. Great. Again, we are right on time. Uh, thank you so much, Ashley. That was a great presentation. Um, thank you. Yeah, and um, uh, feel free to send me any other, uh, if the report comes out or, or uh, if you have that uh, outreach opportunity, uh, feel free to send me an email. I'd be happy to share it uh, with the group email list so that you guys can boost your turnout. Sounds great, thanks. Okay. And uh, our last presentation is gonna come from Emily Duncan at the Los Angeles Water Board. Uh, she's gonna present on the Los Angeles Water Board dredge materials uh, management overview. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, uh, you're a little quiet. Oh, I wonder if I take my headphones out if you'll be able to hear me. You're a little, yeah, that's a little better. Better now? Yeah. Okay, so let me see if I can share my screen. Um, do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. And then if I start slideshow. Okay, we good? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, great, thanks. So, hi, my name is Emily Duncan. And um, it's kind of great to see all the presentations beforehand, provided a lot of background. Um, I work with June Zhu at the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board. And my presentation will be taking somewhat of a step back in terms of like a regional scale look at how the LA Water Board participates in sediment management um, throughout uh, Ventura and LA counties. So. As we've seen in some previous presentations, just a regional context. So in my role at the water board, I work in re the regional program section. And one of my roles is to represent the LA board um, at the Contaminated Sediment Task Force and the Southern California Dredge Material Management Team. I'm also um, the Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program Coordinator for the region fresh water harmful algal bloom coordinator and a 401 WDR permit writer. So I'm kind of covering a lot of topics, but I'll be focusing on sediment management today. So as we've been discussing throughout these presentations, there are quite a few ports in the region. So when I talk about sediment management, we're looking at permits and dredging happening all the way up in Ventura and Oxford region, moving along down the coast into um, San Monica and Marina del Rey, as we discussed. And then a lot of the activity really happens um, that I work on in the ports. So Port of LA and Port of Long Beach. And just a little zoom in on these, um, re these ports in our region. So to give some background, the California Coastal Commission and the Los Angeles Regional Water Board um, established a multi-agency task force called the Contaminated Sediments Tax Task Force or CSTF in 1999 to strategize management of contaminated dredge material in the region. And so participants in CSTF include the US EPA, Army Corps of Engineers, LA District, the California Coastal Commission, the LA Water Board, and other um, 
major dredging project proponents like the Port of Long Beach, Port of LA, City of Long Beach, and LA County through its Beaches and Harbors Department. Um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and National Marine Fisheries Service are also participants, and Heal the Bay is also a key non-governmental stakeholder that participated in developing the MOU. And so in this table, you can see which agencies have um, oversight responsibilities and which agencies are participating and which agencies signed on to the MOU. And so the four regulatory agencies that I mentioned, Army Corps, US EPA, the LA Water Board, and the Coastal Commission have also formed a dredged material management team, which I mentioned at the beginning. So for this um, team of regulatory agencies will review the technical um, material for a proposed dredging project. And the DMMT holds monthly meetings that are open to agency and project proponent staff to discuss upcoming dredging projects. So I'll be discussing some of the process associated with um, the permitting and evaluating of these dredging projects in the, in the LA region. So basically, functionally, the CSTF and the DMMT work, work on reviewing projects at the same monthly meeting. And it's also you know, open to any environmental groups and any other interested parties that wish to participate in the discussion. Um, and I guess one last thing to mention is that this SC DMMT doesn't actually, uh, it incorporates additional counties outside of those in my regional board. So the counties of San Diego, Orange, Los Angeles, Ventura, Santa Barbara, and parts of San Luis Obispo County also participate the, in the SC DMMT, but the CSTF was for the Los Angeles region. So the DMMT is not intended to replace the CSTF, but it's a way to, uh, it ensures timely review of projects that may not be handled by the CSTF. And so here's a little schematic of the permitting process. So it's a flow chart um, let's say the Port of LA, the Port of Long Beach has a project. They would go through their Port Environmental Management Div Division to develop a um, application of development project. So they would work on that um, like at the city, prepare that, review that internally, which would then trigger, you know, whether or not they needed to do a CEQA or NEPA process um, for environmental review depending on how that goes, you know, that can take a while. That's going to happen before they bring, you know, their sediment analysis, sampling and analysis plan. So essentially the city will go through this project, let's say for the Port of Long Beach, if they want to do some maintenance dredging, for example. Then once they develop their sediment and their sampling and analysis plan, they'll submit that SAP to the CSTF DMMT. So at a monthly meeting, we would review their plan and all the age participating agencies that need to sign off on the plan will make their comments, request changes, or approve of that um, study design before moving on to conducting the actual sampling um, and then presenting those results at a future CSTF and DMMT meeting. So after the sampling's been conducted and the results are reviewed, that's when um, the port could propose a disposal or placement location for their material that they're dredging. Um, and that would all be presented and discussed at the DMMT meeting. So all of that process has to happen before the regulatory agencies issue their final permit um, for approval. So here is an example of the decision, or here is the decision tree that the Contaminated Sediment Task Force and the DMMT would use to evaluate possible um, placement of the dredged materials. So based on the sediment characterization, if something's identified as clean, then you could go through this flow chart and potentially use for beach nourishment. So ideally coarse grained material that is relatively clean could be placed back on the beach. And that's a common um, 
practice, especially in Ventura County, where there's a lot of coarse material dredge and placed back on the beach. But in a lot of the ports, some of the materials more contaminated and is not suited for that path. So then you'd follow um, the flow chart for, you know, is it suitable for upland? Like, is it really toxic? Does it need to go upland to a landfill? Or could it go to a confined disposal? Could it go to ocean disposal? So there's various thresholds um, to evaluate whether the dredge material is clean or contaminated and where it can be placed. So the evaluation process is, you know, these are the steps to consider um, before determining disposal options. So the Contaminated Sediment Task Force and the DMMT will then evaluate what's presented um, for a specific project. So a sediment characterization study would typically consist of sediment sample collection, grain size analysis, chemical analysis, including sediment chemistry, tissue chemistry, and elutriate testing, and then biological testing, including solid and suspended particulate phase toxicity testing, and finally bioaccumulation bio potential analysis. So this is all outlined in US EPA and Army Corps guidance. And then there's the requirements for specific analysis or testing are usually driven by the proposed disposal option. So for example, bio, biological testing is normally required when the dredge material is proposed to be disposed of at an ocean disposal site, um, a temporary aquatic storage site or a confined aquatic disposal site or a CAD. But you do not need to do that bi same biological testing if it's determined that upland disposal is necessary. So I'll show you know, the main example of ocean disposal in our region is a location called LA2. It's a US EPA um, ocean dredge material disposal site. And it was, it was designated for clean dredge material in 1977. It's located approximately 5.9 miles offshore and the site has a 3000 foot radius. Um, and the bottom depths range from 380 to over a thousand feet. So. In 2005, this, uh, the annual disposal capacity for LA2 was increased from 200,000 cubic yards per year to 1 million cubic yards per year. And so US EPA is in charge of evaluating the environmental impacts of the site. And so they prepared an environmental impact statement in 2005, which established that dredge material disposal at LA2 since 1977 um, and at, a, at LA3, which is located further south along the coast, had not created um, any significant impacts to marine environment, including water quality and sand supply, and had not significantly affected commercial or recreational fisheries in adjacent ocean waters. And so they, they made this determination based on baseline monitoring, which was conducted um, when the LA2 ocean disposal site was created and they conducted routine monitoring every five years. And then they decided um, to increase that monitoring to every 10 years after their 2005 environmental impact statement. So US EPA region nine manages this site and monitors a total of six ocean disposal sites along the California coast, as well as five around the Hawaiian islands and one west of Guam. So that's LA two, so that's you know, can be determined as a location for dredged material from projects in the LA region. And then an example of a confined disposal facility or CDF is this, this example is in the Port of LA and it's an engineered structure consisting of dikes or other structures that extend above any adjacent water um, to enclose a disposal area for containment of dredged material. So it isolates, um, the material from adjacent waters or land and CDFs have been constructed around the country for containment of dredge material from navigation projects since the 50s, 1950s. And so in conjunction with um, Army Corps, there's been, you know, designs and improvements since the 70s. And the first technical guidance for designing and constructing and managing CDFs to maximize service life and minimize adverse environmental impacts was developed in 1987 
by the Army Corps. And so then the Army Corps continues to update their guidance. But the Port of LA um, designated this former Southwest Marine Shipyard site as a confined disposal facility in 2009 um, through a port master plan amendment for the main channel deepening project. And so the existing shipyard slips were diked to provide an engineered containment site that would isolate contaminated sediments disposed of within the CDF from contact with harbor waters. And there are approximately, it's approximately four acres in size and it was designed to contain approximately 345,000 cubic yards. I know that in 2018, they had maybe 90,000 cubic yards remaining, but and when a, in a recent DMMT meeting, it was unclear what is left. And I know that um, they're trying to preserve space in the CDF. There's not a lot of locations for um, ports and harbors to dispose of some of these materials in a clean and safe manner. And so um, what was interesting in that meeting as the port described that they did have a, a picture of the CDF, I think fairly recently, and they were describing how materials placed in the CDF via clamshell dredge. So I know they're trying to use um, the CDF wisely as they as they continue to work on projects that involve, you know, fairly small amounts of dredging in the port. So I just wanted to provide an overview of a couple examples of disposal options. And other than that, just to conclude that, you know, dredge material management is a huge collaborative effort. It's very, um, a lot of different stakeholders and interagency efforts, regular meetings. And so if you'd like more information or if you'd ever like to attend one of these meetings, you can feel free um, to reach out to me. Um, so yeah, I just thought I'd leave you with a picture of some dredging that was uh, provided on the Army Corps website up in Channel Islands Harbor. So if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Hey, this is Mike Hanks. I'm just curious. Um, I know that uh, space is filling up in the LA confined disposal facility. Um, mm -hmm. How difficult is it to open up new spaces like this? Is it is it like really like a? It it, it, it seems really really difficult, <laughs> and I'm just curious, like what? How hard is it to expand options? I think it's well. Others on this meeting would might be able to speak this better than I, I can. I'm relatively new to the program, but I would say that it's, you know, Port of Long Beach is working on um, trying to get approval for, you know, another site for sediment placement and you, they have to go through the public process for it. I believe they have to go through, um, you know, CEQA and comments and getting it, getting it approved. Uh, so I believe that that, that would also apply for some of these other like CDF facilities. Don't, I, I don't know if June has more input on that process, but yeah, I don't think it's particularly easy. And I think, I think a lot of time, like in the port of Long Beach, they recently finished a huge uh, middle Harbor infill project. And so they were able to take a lot of this material as infill and so most of the time, you know, they're looking for, that's like the ideal scenario for them if they do any projects in the port, but that's not always happening. So yeah, it's, I think it's gonna be, you know, an issue of growing concern moving forward for sure. And th this is Ray, it's a topic for a whole nother discussion, but uh, Newport's in the process of uh, working on a, a CAD, Confined Aquatic Disposal. Uh, they just uh, approved the EIR for that, so they still got a ways to go. Yeah, thanks. Exactly. So the, the, there's like a long process to get it approved. That's great. Thank you for the, the suggestion.
I can go ahead and stop sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. That was a great yeah. presentation. Um, all right, well, we are nearing the end of our meeting. Um, let's see, I'm gonna pull up the agenda one last time. Let's see. And so um, I just want to take a second to thank all of our presenters today. Uh, I want to thank you, Morale, Brenda, June, Emily, and Ashley. Um, I think this is a really, really cohesive, really informative uh, meeting. And so um, I just think it really came, it came together really well. I'm really appreciative. I, uh, we didn't really get any announcements at the beginning of the meeting. And I know that a lot of people have jumped on since. So I just wanna give you guys uh, another chance. Um, if you have any uh, personal or organizational announcements uh, that you'd like to make and share with the group, um, feel free to do so now. And then we also, um, we just got a suggestion uh, about the um, permitting process for the Newport confined uh, aquatic disposal site. Um, so that's a, that's a great uh, suggestion for a future meeting. But um, if anybody has any ideas for future topics, um, or I mean, I might be getting ahead of myself, but it's potentially potential in-person meeting if we're <laughs> ready to do that again. Um, please let me know. You can shout it out right now or um, feel free, send me an email or any, or Chris Marquis or Vanessa Metz at the Coastal Commission because um, we're, you know, we're always uh, happy to have new ideas for the meeting. And then uh, we also are, uh, we don't have too many action items from this meeting. I think that there were, we we're going to try to incorporate any uh, upcoming reports or any um, documents to share in our meeting notes. It will take us um, at least a week or two to uh, ha have those meeting notes finalized and uh, sent out in, in an accessible format um, uh, due to uh, California accessibility laws. It does take us a little bit longer than it used to to get these materials out, but we are working hard to get uh, these materials out to you and post them to the Coastal Commission website for marinas. And we would like, we're, we're going to be doing the same thing for the presentations that were shared today. Um, so if you know somebody that missed out that uh, would be interested in the contents of this meeting, uh, we'll have that ready for you um, in a timely manner. And if that's it, I'm gonna let you guys go to lunch. Um, thank you again, everybody. Uh, I really appreciate having you and uh, look forward to seeing you in about six months or so when we have our next meeting. Thanks, Michael. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, thank Michael. you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Thanks all, take care. Take care. Thank you. Good job, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.